Peter Schmidt uh, from the New Hampshire House. Good evening, my name is Peter Schmidt. I represent Dover Wards 1 and 2 for the past 16 years. I speak to you in, this evening in general opposition to the extension of the license at this particular time since I regard it as <coughs> premature. But, uh, I am concerned about the uh, ASR issue. Uh, I understand that you have uh, a belief that uh, it, it can be safely managed, but I wish to express my concern. However, my major uh, point of contention at this time is a, a concern with regard to the possibility of safely and timely evacuating the seacoast, this area, in case of any kind of an emergency at Seabrook. While I realize that that is not your primary concern, uh, and I have addressed uh, letters to uh, Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healy on several occasions, expressed my concern and believing that it is very important for the first responders in this area to have an opportunity for a public hearing to address the, uh, the issue of whether it's possible for the Seabrook uh, region to be safely evacuated in the, in the event of a nuclear emergency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we now have, by my count, 26. So if everyone gets three minutes, that's, oh, I shouldn't have said that before I did the math. Uh, all right, time, it's time. Um, I'm an attorney, not um, an engineer for the record. So we're gonna get started uh, with our first speaker, um, who is Mr. Comley um, of We The People. I'm asking to approach the microphone and then once you, again, once you get to the microphone, please state your name for the record, and then once you begin your remarks, I'll start the clock. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, I appreciate, uh, my name is Stephen Conley. I'm the founder of We the People. It's a national whistleblower protection organization I founded in 1987. And I found it because my family's in the nursing home profession, and I was told by the former executive director of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to leave a paralyzed resident behind in our nursing home and give her a bottle of potassium iodide to drink if we couldn't move her. So that meant special needs people are expendable. And that came from the executive director of the NRC. And I have tapes here. I uh, hired a licensed drone operator flies plane over the beaches July 4th of 2017 and 18. And you couldn't get a crab out of there that day. So the, the cart's before the horse. I have, I'm a farmer too. And I'll tell you, I'm concerned about everyone on the panel and all the NRC people. Because you know, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. How can you take the chance of not being home? You're gonna be in big trouble. Anyway, you know, I got a sense of humor. Uh, let's see. I'm also the person that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission hired the Department of Justice and had me in court, Massachusetts Federal Court, for six years with a charge of conspiracy to topple their agency. And one of their top investigators, Roger Fontuna, who was the deputy director of the NRC's Office of Investigations, and they uh, charged us with conspiracy. And there are after tape recordings that they say I made them. And I never confirm or deny ever doing tape recording. But if you're in Washington or in New York, ask Giuliani. It's legal. That's what come out of Watergate. Now, I'm releasing, and the panel has it, I'm releasing one of the tape recordings, well, a tape recording, of an NRC informant. The name is redacted because I don't give up names without permission. And uh, I'm going to read you some of it. And if anyone wants a copy of the transcript, they can. And I have a hundred of the tape, of the uh, audio tape, uh, DV tape, of what you see when you're on the beaches on July 4th. And I want to say this, and I've met Joe, and I've met, I've met, the other panel members here before, because I testified last year, and I have to tell you that I really appreciate you transcribing this meeting because last time you didn't do it. And I think that doing this has respect for the public comment. Now this transcript says this, 
And I don't know if Mr. Markey did this or not, but this is part of it. But you say you are mass because they are a bunch of fences. So you came to D.C., the next step is to try and get some D.C. politicians that are interested. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Conway. I'm sorry, but your time's expired. I'm done? You're done. Okay. Well, anyone who wants to copy the packets that the panel has, they're out here, and, and Joe told me that it's okay to give it to the, the staff. So anyone wants the uh, video, I, in all due respect, I think you ought to do it for your kids' future. And uh, thank, I really thank, thank you very much, Mr. Conway. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm Chris Norton. Uh, I'm a board member of the CSEN Research and Education Foundation and the chair of the committee that's working on the uh, opposition to the license amendment request uh, that Seabrook has filed. We could debate the merits of nuclear here tonight. Uh, and by the way, uh, nuclear is not zero carbon. But I don't have time for that because I only have two minutes and 40 seconds left. So let me say that the issue, the primary issue here is no significant hazards. The determination of no significant hazards is key as an issue of small d democracy and fairness. Way back in 2016, the NRC regional office sent assurances to municipalities in the state of Massachusetts um, concerning the uh, uh, ASR problem, alkali silica reaction problem uh, at Seabrook. And to quote, NRC will ensure that Seabrook Structures Monitoring Program properly assesses the condition of structures affected by ASR and ensure they will continue to perform as intended. <clears throat> NRC Commission upheld the admissibility of C10's five contentions, uh, refigured to one, uh, in 2018. In this ruling, NRC staff argued and supported the admissibility of C10 contentions. NRC regulations require that the adjudicatory hearings must be completed before licensing action is taken. However, staff can move to issue a license amendment before completion of an adjudicatory hearing if it would pose no significant hazards. This determination is made by NRC staff and is not reviewable by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, who we are going in front of uh, sometime in the next six months. Now NRC staff has moved to pass the license amendment request in order to pass on license renewal, <clears throat> which is inappropriate since C10's case uh, calls into question the legitimacy of the license amendment, a license amendment request from top to bottom, and because of that fact, calls into question the legitimacy of the license renewal application. Uh, because of all of this, uh, as of tonight, we have filed an emergency petition with the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners to um, hold the license amendment request in abeyance and by extension the license renewal application uh, until there is a proper review of NRC's determination of no significant hazards to ensure that licensing actions do not take place while reviewing the no significant hazards, give due recognition to the significance, complexity, and lack of adequately rigorous study of ASR, which is reflected in the license amendment request from next era, and provide guidance and instruction to staff for establishment of significantly more rigorous and sophisticated state-of-the-art methods. I will only say that one of the two papers I gave to the, to the panel here tonight is from our expert witness, Victor Salma, who is uh, one of the world's leading experts on ASR and has called into question the entire legitimacy of the license amendment request. We are only seeking our chance to have our day in court and for NRC to move to do anything you, on license Chairman. renewal Thank before you. that is done is grossly unfair and undemocratic. Thank you. Thank you. All right, just to give you a, a status update, I have 16 people who would still like to speak. 16 people would still like to speak this evening. Um, assuming we go through them at the pace we are, there will be some time at the end. So again, people who ha uh, would like to say more may well have an opportunity to do so. Again, my. My goal here is not to cut people off. I want people to have their opportunity to have their say. But again, I need to make sure first that everyone is, who wants to have an opportunity to speak took their time out of uh, their normal routine to come to this meeting tonight has an opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. My name is Daniel Duarte. I just came over here tonight uh, to show my
concern um, about the power plant. Uh, my major concern is about the location, um, and I have a question. I wanted to know if the location uh, is in danger for a flood in the next 10, 20 years, and also um, if it's a flood in the location, uh, if we have a waste, a nuclear waste um, storage, and if it will be a problem for the environment. <laughs> And uh, my other concern is um, if it's an EMP attack or a power grid lost, uh, if the nuclear reactor will be uh, in danger. I have a few questions, uh, yes or no. I'd like to give one of you each, if you possible can uh, answer and give it back to me, I appreciate it. Okay, uh, sir, I, I, I think we have time for a few more questions. Let me try to answer the first couple of questions I heard. Um, we didn't bring the experts here uh, related to flooding hazards or, or EMP, but I do know that, that, that that's considered as part of, you know, of the uh, review of the safe operation of the plant, and they have to, you know, this had to be evaluated, and it's part of the license now. So um, I'm not sure if we have anybody in the audience that could talk in, you know, in any detail about those issues, but. Flooding hazards are evaluated for plants. What were, what were your other yes or no questions? Um, I have a, just a few questions, just concerns um, about... Um, it's true that the nuclear reactor will likely to melt down with our electricity to cool them? Yes or no, sir, please. The plants are designed with safety systems to address the loss of electricity to cool them down. Thank you. Uh, if we have an EMP attack, how long can we cool down the, the facility? Um, I don't think we, I, I don't have expertise in there. I don't have an expert here on that. Thank you. But I think that anything, anything that causes a loss of electrical supply to the plant uh, has got just systems to provide electricity to uh, replace any lost sources that allow cool down. Do you know for how long? Offhand, I don't know. Thank you. Have the nuclear power plant been working together with the people to inform the danger and to support the community about the flood and about EMP attack? Uh, I, I don't know if this has come up in other meetings that I haven't been a party to. So I, I, I myself can't answer that question. I'm, I wonder if this, is, if this came up in any of the annual assessment meetings, maybe? No. Okay. I don't think so. Have anybody provided readiness and awareness plan to the seacoast and surrounding community for a nuclear disaster? Well, I believe the evacuation plan is provided, but Thank I'm not you, sure sir. anyone else. I appreciate it. Are the facility responsible to support the affected area zone by having ready food, water, transportation, and shelter in place for everyone that might be or will be affected if anything happens? Again, this is part of the emergency plan. I, I don't know the details of that myself. And th that subject is you know, outside the scope of what we want to talk about tonight. Thank you. And I'm just going to uh, ask again one more time if the facilities are located in a high risk of flood. <coughs> yes or no? I, I, I don't know the risk level of flood, but all plants are evaluated for flood hazards wherever, wherever they happen to be located. Thank you, sir, very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. So uh, just, just to clear up this, I'll, I'll echo Joe. Um, we, the purpose of the meeting tonight um, is to discuss specifically ASR and the licensing <coughs> and the process. So the experts we have here, particularly Angie, not that I'm discounting anyone else in the room, um, is to discuss ASR, okay? Because that's what we thought the bulk of our questions would be on. We are having a meeting in April, our annual assessment meeting. Uh, what we'll do um, is take this back to the region who prepares, region one, who prepares for those annual assessment meetings, make sure that we address these issues that you just raised at that meeting, which is generally the more broad overall plant performance for the year. Again, the purpose of the meeting tonight, it, 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 and I bring that up just because it's who we have in the room with us, it, we thought the question we primarily focused on the, the licensing process and questions specifically on ASR. Um, so that's who we have experts in the room. Um, so hence uh, our answers to those questions. So again, we will write those down. Justin is writing those down right now. We're going to take those back, uh, give those to the region, and we'll make sure that they're addressed um, for, uh, um, uh, 
preemptively, if you will, um, at the annual assessment meeting, which will be scheduled late in April. Okay, next. I'm messing up my own clock. We have Doug uh, Bogan. Doug Bogan. My name is Doug Bogan. I'm uh, the executive director of Seacoast Anti-Pollution League based in Exeter. Um, I have attended many of these meetings. Uh, we've heard all about how many public meetings we've had, a dozen or more. I think one count was 23 of them. I've attended a lot of them, not all, but uh, I would submit that while we've had many public meetings, we've had zero formal public hearings. And I say this as one of the uh, former interveners um, to this time and over the last eight, nine years, there have been three different petitions, five uh, different organizations that have attempted to intervene. We were originally given approval uh, standing by the uh, uh, ASLB, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission overruled that and denied us a hearing. And so you can imagine we're dismayed to hear that now you want to issue the, the new license before we have a hearing with the remaining interveners that are still looking to represent the public interest in a formal hearing. So I submit that that doesn't make sense. I understand you can do that under your rules, but it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't pass the smell test from a public interest point of view from common sense. And it's not surprising that our congressional delegation would intervene uh, in, in uh, this process to say the public deserves more input. But I would also submit that this meeting here tonight does not uh, represent, does not uh, take the place of a formal public hearing. And so I would think that uh, we should listen to what all they are saying and move forward with a, a formal hearing before you issue the license. Now, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, nuclear being carbon free, a lot of about climate action. Um, it's great to hear there's so many climate activists in this group. I would hope we could make much better progress on climate uh, with so much interest. Um, but I would mention that nuclear is not carbon free. Uh, there have been studies shown when you look at the total life cycle of, of nuclear, particularly the fuel fabrication, the fuel production, it does require a lot of energy to produce that, and most of that comes from fossil fuels. There's uh, one study, a study of studies, uh, found that uh, renewable energy, uh, um, wind and solar, is many times more, less carbon intensive than nuclear, uh, five to seven times uh, less in the case of wind power. And uh, we intervened on this issue of whether we could replace nuclear with wind. And sure enough, we are finding that is the case. There are thousands of megawatts of w offshore wind power being contracted for south of the Cape right now in the next few months, the next few years. And we should be looking at that rather than debating about other issues that, that aren't relevant. Um, I just want to ask, what is the hurry? Why does this, what makes a difference whether this is issued next week versus nine months from now? Why can't you wait until the final, the hearing? And I'm not just Thank saying you. that rhetorically. I would like an answer on that because we've gotten very precious few answers from this, uh, this body here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, it's a good question because, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, originally we planned to issue it after the hearing. Uh, besides, you already know, the regulations allow it. The staff's work's done in the safety review. So we have uh, letters from the ACRS that independently reviewed the safety evaluations and uh, agreed with the conclusions. They didn't have any other additional technical questions for us to pursue. By issuing the amendment and the renewal, we are able to put any of the requirements related to the ASR monitoring and management program into the license. So uh, that, that makes it solid in their license now, and it does not undermine the hearing. The hearing, will per, that, that process is independent of our work, uh, the, the, the board has documents to, to, to review. They'll get more information as a, me, as, as a means of the hearing, from the hearing process that they evaluate. As I said 
earlier, the, the outcome of the hearing could result in us having, the staff having to go back and take action to uh, uh, change the license further. If there's information that, uh, that, that's presented to the board and the board makes a uh, finding and we have to implement something, we'll, we'll do that. We can go as far as issuing an order to the plant to do that. So uh, back, to, you know, back to it being a rush, uh, our perspective is that it's not been a rushed review. It's been um, many years since uh, the uh, staff had an initial draft safety evaluation on license renewal. And, and one of the open items, the major open items, uh, related to ASR. And our position was that we were not going to renew the license until we got satisfactory answers to questions that, could, that are now answered by the license amendment and our review of that. So we don't feel like we, we've rushed that. The, the amendment review took more than two years. And we think with our work done, we can promptly issue the license. We're not undermining the hearing. And by issuing these actions, we get those requirements into the license. It still doesn't answer my question of why, what difference it would make whether you waited six months. After nine years, you'd think you could wait another six months. Again, it's 11 years before the license renewal runs out, the existing license runs out. We are not going to freeze in the dark. The lights aren't going to go out. You aren't going to lose your jobs anytime soon. We have another decade of plan operations. I understand you want to get it done ahead of time, and you evidently have nothing better to do than issue the license. But we demand a better say in what is going into thank, that thank license you. renewal. Thank I, you. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to respond to you, though, because I, I think that, um, again, we're not rushing to judgment at all. I want to tell you that uh, we have <coughs> other work for our staff to do. We have to, one of our key principles is to be as efficient as we can. So we have people who worked on this and, and continue to track and report on it. And so by issuing it, we can complete that work, move on to other work, if required, you know, as an outcome of this hearing. If need be, we have to assign people back to uh, redo the safety evaluation and put other requirements into place, we'll do that. But we're trying to be as efficient as we can. I, I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that there's an urgency to it. No, that we, don't have a, we don't have an urgency uh, except to be as efficient as we can. Uh, and and uh, you know, if it appears urgent, I just, I just point to the perspective that, that we have of, of doing a long and, and, and complex review on the renewal itself and on this amendment. Well, again, it wouldn't have it thank, would have thank been you done much. already. Well, there, there will be, I, I appreciate that you have ongoing questions and comments you'd like to raise. However, out of fairness to everyone else in the room who would sure. still like to speak, there will probably be an opportunity for you to speak later on. Okay. If we thank get, you. Right, so of 10. Thank you. Next, we have Patricia Torkildson. Torkildson? Close enough. Sorry, again, I apologize. I'm Patricia Torkelson, and I'm a resident of Newburyport. Next Era's nuclear power plant in Seabrook is an important source of energy for our area, and I appreciate that it's a cleaner source of energy than coal. But the plant also needs to be a source of energy that is safe for the surrounding communities. I came here tonight not to oppose the license extension for Seabrook, but to ask that the license extension not be granted at this time. Wait until after the issues with the concrete are fully vetted with the public. Hold the public hearing with the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board that was promised for this coming summer. Allow the issue of the degraded concrete to be fully discussed with the public at that meeting and allow time for the public to digest and respond to what we learn. When it comes to nuclear power, safety needs to be a major concern for the government. When a nuclear power plant is deteriorating due to ASR, the government's concern should be even greater. This concern is not shown when the government appears to be rushing to extend the license of a plant that is already degraded. With 11 years left on the license, on the plant's license, what's the rush? I know that some scientists agree with the company that the degrading concrete is being properly monitored and controlled, but others have raised concerns that will be brought forth at the summer hearing. 
let them be heard before a, a license extension is granted. It is important for the residents of this area that we feel our safety is a primary concern that has been fully addressed. Remember, Seabrook is not just a nuclear power plant. It's a nuclear power plant with ASR. Next we have Herb Moyer, O-Y-E-R. That's you? Correct. Okay. Do you need someone to operate your camera? No. For you? Okay. No. Good, thanks. Well, Mr. Moyer comes up. I'll just let you know there's seats opening up within the audience here for any of those people standing in the back. I'm sure your legs are getting tired. Uh, my name is Herb Moyer. I'm a 47-year resident of Exeter, New Hampshire. I taught at one attended high school, biology, ecology, and botany from 1969 to 1990. Worked for IBM for four years, etc. So I've been around, and I've been involved in the Seabrook nuclear plant issue since 1972. I'm the president of the Seacoast Anti Pollution League, one of two citizen organizations that have been following this issue since the very beginning. Um, not only does the Seabrook nuclear plant have concrete credibility, the NRC has cr lack of credibility on its own merits because they have taken positions that are anathema to safety of the public. I cite a uh, Atomic Safety and Licensing Board Helen Hoyt comment in response to the failure of the then utility to implement a security measure, a safety measure, on backup uh, security systems. Her comment was, the utility's commitment to comply is evidence of compliance. Now, I don't know if you view that as a legitimate scientific statement, but it's certainly bogus. A commitment to comply to something does not prove that you've done the compliance. And that's the way this issue has been slanted by the NRC against public safety and public interest. Long history. I had probably 15 or 20 students of mine who worked at the plant, came back to me teaching at Winnicott telling me stories. Now these are anecdotal, but these are students who worked at the plant, took their time to come back to me and sit, because they knew I was working with the Seacoast County Pollution League back in the 70s, 80s, and they indicated that there are people that are throwing beer bottles and, and pouring uh, baby lotion to the concrete pours. So there are voids in that concrete. And I know that from the veracity of the students who told me these things. If you will check the Hampton Falls police records, you will find some 300 DWI arrests for plant workers going to the plant and coming from the plant. So. There was a lot of drinking on site at the plant. That's a, m a matter of public record. So, you know, those of you who have a role in nuclear power today, I'm not casting aspersions on you, but there are clearly some issues that haven't been addressed. So, um, we have fought long and hard. I'll bet Sapple over the years has spent nearly a million dollars in legal fees to oppose the licensing. And uh, it's it's terrible that the NRC, who studied the Fukushima accidents, listed a whole bunch of, of uh, rip fixes, none of which, virtually none of which, they've implemented in, in anything but a, a voluntary way through Thank the you. plants on, throughout the U.S. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> right, next we have Catherine. Uh, Capra, Catherine Capra. Hi, I'm Catherine Capra. I'm from Georgetown, Massachusetts. And um, I'm very concerned about the safety um, of the plant. I heard many words that were alarming to me and saw some um, on the slide and from the engineer. Um, progressive, it's causing cracking. It cannot be reversed, causing degradation. Um, and then I read that it can be managed or corrected, and I don't know how you can do that with something that is irreversible and progressive, what you mean by that. 
and what you would do. So um, I'll take that as a question. Okay. So, so uh, I'm not the expert on concrete. So I'm going to ask Angie to be ready to hear in a second. But the, uh, the the ASR degradation is slow, so it, it's possible to monitor it and see how far it does progress. It's progressive. So you can see how far it progresses in other places in the plant where it may present itself. Right? I know that the plant has conducted some repairs where necessary on structures that are affected by ASR. So uh, th th there's a monitoring program and there's the ability to uh, make repairs as needed to maintain the structural uh, capability of the, of, the of the safety related structures. Uh, <coughs> correcting or reversing is not, is, is, is the kind of phenomenon you can't do that. So this, this monitoring has to stay in place and as I said earlier, that, that's why this monitoring program is so important and why it should be part and we think it will be put into the license. Okay? Is there anything you can add to that, Angie? Um, sorry, I haven't talked in a while, so my throat's hoarse again. But I, I just wanted to say that that ASR is a is a it is indeed a degradation mechanism, and it's an aging effect, along with concrete. I won't. I'll say there are a multitude of aging effects that affect concrete that are factored into the concrete design codes when concrete's designed. Um, the the American Concrete Institute accounts uh, provides for safety factors that account for all types of degradation. Cracking occurs in all concrete over time as it ages. ASR the the whole reason that the the plant uh, pursued a license amendment was to look at the effects of ASR as another aging effect and to incorporate structure it into structural analyses that can show that even with ASR that the structures are able to to perform their function their structural functions and that there is and that there is enough margin in those in those calculations so that ASR can be considered under the under the licensing uh, basis for the plan. Um, I'm sorry, I, I have limited time, right? I wanted to. Um, I, I stopped the clock. Normally, I don't oh, do okay. this, but so. Okay. It was your question. I thought was okay. likely one other people. Anyway, go okay, on. Thank go, you. go. Did you have something else? To no, I, I just wanted to say that it, that the, the, that's the whole basis of the license amendment was to incorporate the effects of ASR into the into the structural calculations that already exist for the plant. Um, so, um, if it were to progress to the point where it affected the functioning of the structures, what would you do? So, so part of the so part of our, our safety evaluation and the and the license amendment request was to look at their monitoring program to determine for each structure what are what are they monitoring and what are the acceptance criteria and how did they come to those so so they're they're monitoring I'm sorry could you stop the clock while she's answering? sure thank okay. you okay. um so so th they they did an analysis for every structure and determined by by mathematical analysis how much ASR by, and they, they measure micro crack measurements and actual physical measurements are taken at the plant and each structure each area has a, a what they call a threshold for ASR expansion and there this license amendment puts in a requirement to that 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 ASR cannot progress past the established acceptance <coughs> limit so as the staff we looked at those limits specifically and to understand and and also cross-reference that with calculations to determine whether we felt that they would could safely get to those limits if if they got to those limits mm -hmm. they would need to they would just like any other issue that would come up they would need to assess the issue and determine and the NRC would would concurrently uh, through our oversight process determine whether they would or would continue to be to save to be safely operated. So we would, you know, if, if they got to those limits, then they would need to do further assessments and the NRC would intervene under our, our oversight. 
So would they take it offline if they found it reached the threshold, like to do the assessments? Or yeah, you know, I'm concerned that they would continue to operate when it might. The, the NRC has the, has the authority to to do that if necessary. Okay, because I'm concerned about about that. Um, and then um, somebody already addressed about the license and why you're. Um, wanting to extend the license um, before the current one expires. Um, and I'm really, I, you've already answered this, but I just have to say I'm really anxious about that. Um, I would, I would, I wish that, you know, it could just, um, that could be um, delayed so that more monitoring could be done. Um, and also, um, was the testing that was done done on actual pieces of concrete from the plant when it was evaluated from AS for ASR. Um, the, the, in, in the testing program, uh, the, the specimens that were used were uh, constructed from co different constituents uh, <laughs> that are that were similar and representative of the concrete at the plant, including aggregate taken from partially taken from a quarry um, here in New England. Um, some of the constituents were a little bit different because they needed to accelerate um, ASR. ASR at Seaborg is a very slow progressing right. reaction. It, 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 it's come to this point over the, you know, 40 years or however long the concrete's been in place. So the testing program needed to come to accelerated levels of ASR degradation in a short time. So the only real difference is between that concrete it was really the the constituents that were used to accelerate ASR, so that you could t test to limits that that would bound the plan. Okay, thank you. Um, so basically, the bottom line though is it was not actual concrete taken from the actual plant. It was used accelerants, and it was from a similar area. Is that correct? That, that, that's correct. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. We have uh, Neo Young. Neo Young? Neo Young, I'm from Newburyport, Mass. I'm a concerned citizen. I'm very concerned about the safety of the plant. I'm also concerned um, about the public input tonight, and I, I just came here to hear everything you have to say but I, I'm afraid that it might be skewed by either Next Era or the Seabrook Town coordinating plant speak, you know, people that are in favor of the plant speaking here, many of <coughs> whom don't even live in the area. That, that kind of was a trigger for me when I heard people from way outside the area are here speaking. Um, I have several questions. Um, one is, are you saying that Next Era will be monitoring the ASR itself? Um, if so, this is a great concern. I think there should be independent monitoring of the ASR. It's kind of like the fox guarding the hen house. Um, it also sounds like you've already made a decision, so I'm wondering whether our input tonight will have any effect on the licensing. Um, and can you better explain who actually makes the final decision on the license? Is it the results of the hearing or your conclusion? Um, I was a little confused about that tonight. And then, why does the license extension have to be so long for an old plant? Um, so many things can change in 20 years. It seems that the management can become lax over such a long period. Um, the fear of renewal would keep the plant on their toes. And I'm also concerned um, about what the gentleman raised earlier, um, flooding and global warming and the plan for that and how that would impact, impact the plant over a 20 year period. Those are my questions. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, I'll try to get to all of them. The, um, the program in place that's already in place to monitor ASR uh, is inspected by the NRC. So uh, we're, we're watching, we have been and we continue uh, to do inspections. We have residents on site who, who watch and inspect all of the activities 
of the plant, and this will be another inspection activity uh, that, that will be included. And they'll so, be there going forward as well. Yes, yeah. So, you know, the, 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 I'm trying to allevi alleviate your concern there, is that it's, it, it's not Nextera on their own, it's Nextera like anything else, all their other programs are inspected by the NRC. And uh, they, they have to do, especially once it's in their license, but even now they're, they're, they're putting programs in place and we're, we're inspecting them. <coughs> uh, I think the final decision, uh, the, the commission delegated the license renewal to the uh, Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. So uh, it's, it's management uh, at the office level, not the commission itself. Now, we informed the commission of our intent to, to issue uh, the, the license, and in, in this case also there will be a notification of the license amendment because it's subject to a hearing. Uh, but the decision to do those things is at the office level. Office yeah. meaning you guys or somebody else? Okay. Actually, my, actually my boss, but... Your boss. Yeah, yeah. And that's, is that part so, of the hearing? Is the hearing totally separate then? Right, right, right. The, the hearing, yeah. The, the hearing process is separate from the licensing process. And I, I, I'll, I'll, as I said before, there could be an outcome from the hearing that requires us to go back and to licensing to do something. But those are intentionally kept separate. Okay? Uh, input tonight. So uh, there's going to the, the be, uh, I think Brett said, there's a transcript being kept. Uh, there's material that's being handed to us. Uh, so there'll be document, a document, a, a meeting summary that will include uh, the, a reference to the transcript. It'll include all the information that's been submitted to us tonight. We're going to review that and see if there's anything new uh, that that would affect our decision. Uh, length of the inspection of, of the uh, uh, extension. So uh, in the regulations, uh, so the, new, the NRC regulations uh, for for re renewal license, renewed licenses were uh, put in place and, and there's a lot of background uh, to, to those where the commission considered what made sense. And what made sense was no, an extension no longer than 20 years. That seemed reasonable. I think it touches on some of the things you talked about. Things could change over some time. So uh, some, some practical things without getting into a lot of technical detail uh, are that you know the, the original license made some assumptions that went out to 40 years. To go beyond those 40 years, there's new information that's needed. There's aging mechanisms besides concrete that, that, that affect other things besides concrete that have to be accounted for. And uh, the, the plant has to demonstrate that they can put programs in place to, to support that 20 year interval. And, and we won't relicense beyond that interval. So it's, you know, if, if, and there are some plants now that are coming in for a subsequent license renewal, but we won't go. Yeah, you know, that 20 years is the most will extend at any one time. All right? So those, all those things that the plant has to do to, to uh, be able to, besides concrete, there's other things that a plant has to do to be able to prove to us that they can operate safely when they get their license extension. Those are all subject to inspection. They're all part of their license. If they don't do them, Angie already said, for concrete or other things, we could issue orders. Those orders could be to, to, uh, to the extent of shutting down until they can correct the problem. Okay? Mm -hmm. but I, did I touch on I think I, I tried to keep notes when you're asking. I think I got them all. Yeah. Okay, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, um, next we have Linda Cooper. Linda Cooper. Thanks, Linda Cooper. I live in Newburyport and I'm an engineer. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier in the meeting that the ASR only occurs in certain types of, of concrete. So how can you guarantee that the concrete used in testing in Texas is the same as what, what was used to build Seabrook, thus coming to the conclusion that it's safe? And secondly, is there a chance of the rebar breaking down because of the ASR and is that part of the monitoring? Okay, so... Uh Thanks for your question. Uh, just make sure I got them. Uh, the similarity of the test specimens that are concrete. Uh, I think Angie addressed that, but she can give you a little bit more detail. But the other 
new new question, I think, for tonight. The rebar? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does ASR yeah, affect the rebar? Yeah, does it affect the rebar, and is that part of the monitor? Right. right, and I don't know the answer to that, and I'm wondering if Angie can shed light on it. Okay, so so I, I wanted to speak high level to the representativeness um, that, that the staff found between the, the test specimens and, and Seabrook, because that's a, a key component of the hearing. Um, that that's going to be taking place, and so what we what we can say is really needs to be limited to what's available in the safety evaluation. But <coughs> I will just say that, that the staff found that the that the the concrete uh, was built to uh, the same specs as as Seabrook in terms of reinforcement and size, um, and it was tested to loadings that that are are part of the Seabrook design. Um, you know, we we independently audited and inspected, and determined that the, the testing was consistent with testing that was used to develop ACI 318 codes. So it, it, it was it was in line with with sound engineering science, and we and we determined that the testing was applicable to be used as a basis for for the Seabrook monitoring. Um, that's and that's actually uh, really. Uh, well detailed in the safety evaluation and for the license amendment request um, if you're interested in, in, in getting more detail um, yeah actually it's in section 3.2.1 of the um, of the license amendment safety evaluation and the, the link to that is in the slides um, the second question about rebar breaking down um, so there's two there's two Issues and I'll be brief, but the one issue could, it, you know, would be the concern maybe that there would be corrosion of rebar. Um, there were multiple cores taken at Seabrook that showed that there was no corrosion issue um, for for rebar and, and multiple cores um, on the order of dozens around uh, on different areas of the site, and that makes sense because of the alkaline, um, the alkaline nature of the reaction would actually cause it to be. Would, would cause it to be a, a higher pH area, which would be less likely to have corrosion. But, but um, that's right now, though. What about so, well, in the future? So in the future, if there was ever to be rebar corrosion because of water infiltration caused by any aging effect, that would uh, that would come to the surface of the concrete, and the concrete's inspected. Um, like I think I mentioned, every six months to three years, uh, depending on the area, and so that would be that would be identified and um, addressed prior to any sort of structural issue. Um, and as far as ASR breaking down rebar, that that that's not known to to occur. But how would you address the if something did happen to rebar? So. Um, <coughs> If something, I'm, I'm just trying. I'm trying to think of what something might happen with with rebar. I, so what what I can say is that is that what 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 part of the testing was to look at was rebar anchorage to make sure that um, that te the specimens in the testing program were able to maintain the the reinforcement length between the rebar. And so when they tested the specimens, they found that the rebar didn't. So to speak, break apart, which which it is something that you would look at in, in the testing. So when they tested the, the rebar, the to to the tested limits, which were beyond what what the design basis for Seabrook were, the reinforcing bars for all of the specimens held intact with their with their required um, anchorage lengths. So so they found that that it, there there wasn't a a, a, a rebar um, slippage. Issue that that would is not <coughs> to occur. But that testing was only done on like a certain amount of time. We don't know what twenty years from now would be. The the, right. the testing was no, well. The testing was uh, to limits of ASR expansion that are well beyond an anticipated um, at the site. And so those those limits were actually are used then they, those feed into the monitoring um, with a with a large cushion of margin um, that that. The, that the site monitors to, um, so so actually those levels of ASR were were, were well beyond what what is ex expected for through the life of the plan and the extended life. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephen, Christopher, from the Massachusetts Lobsterman 
Thanks, Jay Gustafero. I want to, uh, I want to use this, this moment here. I'm going to beg your forgiveness to move off from ASR for a quick moment. Make this kind of a teaching moment for my friends. Uh, Mike. Mike. Friends and neighbors in the seacoast here. And have you all asked yourself, those of you who've been lobbied to come down here and speak, you know, in favor of, of relicensing this thing, why they're in such a rush to do it? Why is that? Because, you know, it's not going to be a problem getting it through the NRC. They, they're not really a nuclear regulatory agency. They're more of a lobbying agency. So why, why has, you know, the industry put out so much pressure to bring so many of us down here to speak in favor of this thing. It, we're 10 years out before it's even up. It's so that they can borrow more money on that decrepit electric tea kettle out there. They want to borrow as much money as they can, as quickly as they can, because they know, the people with the money, what a piece of crap it is. And I'm sure that all the regulators know that also, but maybe that's for another thing. So I just wanted to, you know, those of you who who live in this community, don't be too quick to be supporting this industry and these guys and ask yourself why. Why has there been such a, such a push to support it? What's the rush? That's the rush, so they can get as much out of that thing as they can and then get the hell out of Dodge with, with their money. So, so the ASR, ASR question. Um, you know, I think Mark Twain may have said it best that there's three kinds of lies. There's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's where you're all at, which is statistics. It's turned into sand, guys. Yo, <coughs> sand. It's breaking down. It should have never been licensed to begin with. And maybe just a, a little plea of humanity for you guys since I spent the last two minutes yelling at you or around you. It was a gentleman from my community, I think his name was McGlennon, he was the only NRC commissioner up to that point who ever voted against a power plant. And go back and read some of his testimony for why he objected to Seabrook. It was kind of a landmark uh, thing that he actually objected. And of course, you know what happened to him. They ran him out of town on a rail, but I got to know him many decades ago, and he always told me he slept better. And, uh, I guess. I guess that's all for this evening. Thank you all. Don't be so quick to believe it. You know, common sense is uncommon. Think about the why. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Next up, we have William uh, Woodward. 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 I am William Woodward. I teach uh, psychology at the University of New Hampshire. I'm a professor, I'm a historian of science in terms of my PhD. I'd like to just interject the long view here. The long view takes us back to the resistance to situating a nuclear power plant right here. Uh, one of the objections was you don't have an answer to what you're going to do with the spent fuel. I still haven't heard the answer. Why are we talking about that tonight? There's a, there's a national program to ship it to Native American lands in New Mexico and Texas, but that's very, very dangerous. So that would be something to look into with NIST, which is an organization pointing out the flaws in getting rid of nuclear waste. Another long view perspective would be to look at Germany. Germany, after they watched Fukushima, <coughs> said, we're going off of nuclear for public safety reasons. It's not a safe energy. Another thing we could look at in the big picture would be the state of Maine. Until Governor LePage came along, there was a pilot program to have offshore wind replace all the nuclears on the East Coast. It's actually doable. They were set back by LePage, and now Massachusetts has caught up. And I understand they have several uh, plants going now. Investors believe that this is the future. My university is going to 50% renewables by 2030 
uh, renewables by 2050. Why, are, why don't we have scientists here talking about, climate scientists, talking about what we need to do over the next 30 to 50 years? I'm disappointed by the quality of the panel here, frankly. You know, I mean, where are the scientists? This is not very persuasive. <coughs> Why are we going to rush ahead without having a hearing from not only the public, but from the scientists? What is the rush? And unfortunately, this is what I've been hearing for 44 years. I've been living in Durham. I get the NRC doing a whitewash instead of answering our questions. And for, I think they must be staffed by insiders. It's, it's not, right now we're trying to get monitors in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, independent monitors and they're telling us we don't need them. Well, what do you think? Massachusetts thinks we need them. They have state-funded monitors. But I heard a hearing in Concord last week. The industry was saying, no, we don't need them. It's all taken care of right here. In this, at Seabrook, they're doing all the monitoring that's needed. We got pediatric cancer. Not only here, in the seacoast, but around every reactor in the country. There's data on that. Why don't we have that data? Why don't we discuss how many kids have to get cancer to, to, to support this industry? Thank, thank, you, thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you. Okay. Next we have Mesmer. Mesmer. Minnie Mesmer. The former representative for the State House for RAI, uh, environmental scientist with a master's degree in public health. Uh, I have a few questions, um, actually a lot of questions, so I'm not sure if you want me to go through them first. And go, then, go through them okay. and then... Why well, can you not decouple the license amendment from the license extension? Why is the rush? I'm, I echo Senator Markey's concerns about that and some of the other people that have spoken tonight. Um, I would like to know if um, you say, Angie, that there are cores taken from the concrete, dozens of them. Why were not those cores or some similar cores used to do the ASR evaluation? Uh, I'd like to know what the stage of degradation of all the concrete structures are at the plant and how was that modeled if you didn't take concrete from the plant itself to do that. I'd like to know why uh, the second structure that was never turned into reactor, we only had one, there were two structures there, one was used, uh, why you weren't testing that structure instead because it has the same kind of concrete. Uh, when you say slowly, I keep hearing slowly. What does that mean? What is slowly? I want to know the, did you use that, uh, what, what kind of calculations were made to assess whether or not the concrete would be stable enough to be safe over the license extension period? Uh, we also talked a little bit, some people here about seawater intrusion. I'm concerned about that. Whether calculations of seawater intrusion that we know provides additional alkali for the ASR reaction was taken into account because we know that there will be chronic inundation on the seacoast over time due to sea level rise. Um, I also want to know if uh, somebody mentioned the dry cast storage area. We do have spent nuclear fuel rods being stored on the facility. I want to know if uh, that has been taken into account when we talk about sea level rise, whether our first responders and firefighters are being specially trained to uh, respond to uh, an emergency situation at the plant. Uh, assuming they'll be exposed to some sort of radiation. And after serving on Governor Hassan's task force to investigate the pediatric cancer cluster, uh, Mr. Woodward's correct, we have a pediatric cancer cluster in the seacoast. We also were told by the CDC that we have the highest rates of pediatric cancer in the nation here. We also have the highest rates of bladder cancer in New Hampshire in the nation, along with breast um, and esophageal cancer and bladder cancer. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is to know what our exposure is. We know that there's some radiation ex uh, released during regular maintenance activities. We wonder about the ASR and whether or not there's additional radiation being released as a result of the ASR. And we would like to know in our communities what our real-time exposure is to radiation. We would like to have real-time radiation monitors in the seacoast outside of the plant so the communities know what their exposure is. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. A lot of questions. We'll try to get them all. You saw us taking notes. I, tried to go all so once. Let's, huh? I got them all at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. But, you know, but when we get through, right. let me know if we, we didn't touch on okay. something we want to hear about. So on, on uh, decoupling the license renewal and the, uh, mm -hmm. and the license amendment. So I'll start, and then I think Eric's going to fill in gaps. I'll probably leave on the answer. Is that 
Um, in order to relicense the plant, the licensing basis of the plant needs to include the programs to okay to, to address ASR. And um, you know, you know the, right now the way uh, the, the safety evaluations are structured is the technical review for ASR is largely in the license amendment. So that gets you know the plan would be to issue that. Once that's issued, the license renewal would follow. So why can't you decouple that and just do the amendment that has to do with the ACR, ASR? Oh, I see. Okay. Evaluation. So, so okay. that we get that in place, and then late, you know, why rush to extend the license? Okay. All right. Well, again, again, my perspective is that we're not rushing to, to issue the license amendment. Once that's in place, we don't see a, a need to to hold up the license renewal, uh, issuing the license amendment, and, that, and that's what the contention is on, is a subject, the subject of the hearing is the license amendment. So, um, you know, we, we'd still be having a, a similar question, right? We'd still be taking an action before the hearing. So, uh, the, the renewal Actually, safety evaluation, question. go ahead. Whether the April, um, while you're doing this before the April, and whether or not the April meeting is gonna be public, the and why are you doing it ahead of the April meeting? The April meeting. Sorry, so the here, the ASLB hearing, uh, that, that was going to be even later in the year. Pardon? I think on our slide there, it's mid to late 2019. So, so the maybe you think about a different, a different. Somebody meeting. mentioned but, an April assessment meeting. Yeah, that's the annual. Oh, assessment. the annual assessment meeting for the plant that the region runs. Yeah. So, so again, yeah, uh, I'm going to say again the the. Uh, Safety evaluation is complete. It's been a long review, both the license renewal itself and the license amendment, relatively long uh, compared to other similar actions. And we find there's no safety concern from, <coughs> from what we've looked at. So we're ready to issue the actions. Those don't undermine the hearing. So the hearing can progress, and any outcome of that hearing, if need be, we can go back and change the license in this area, uh, uh, including up to ordering the plan to do something. So, so Joe, you did a great job of covering everything. I'm just going to add some specifics. Um, for the license amendment, that includes the methodology <coughs> which the NRC will approve for next era to evaluate uh, the impact of ASR degradation on, on concrete structures and also the monitoring programs for ASR. Now that evaluation methodology and those monitoring programs form the basis for the aging management programs that are being credited in the license renewal application. So there's the connection right there. And so the, they cannot be decoupled. So the license amendment has to be approved to get those things into the licensing basis for the plan and update the, the licensing basis so that the that new licensing basis, updated licensing basis, can be renewed uh, for the plan. So there's no mechanism by which you can amend the license to address the ASR without extending the license? No, it goes the other way around. We have to amend the, the license first to include the analysis methodology for ASR before we can renew the license. I know, but I'm saying why can't you just amend the license to address the ASR through the regular process of allowing us to have a public comment period and then address the license extension later on. That could be done, um, but we are following our normal process where we evaluate what was requested of us, come to our safety conclusion, and in addition, this is not part of the normal process, but uh, because ASR was such a, an important issue for Seabrook and for the NRC and for the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, they also wanted to look at what was done by, by the applicant and the staff's review, and so they confirmed uh, the staff's conclusions through their peer review. So now we've got independent verification uh, from a very highly technical and independent review body uh, of the NRC staff's conclusions. And based on those conclusions, um, safety conclusions, the, the expectation of the staff is that we issue the licensing action promptly. And the hearing is independent of that licensing action. And like Joe said, the specific issues 
that are under contention in that hearing will be adjudicated by the board, and if there are any actions that come out of that the board's decision, the staff will take the, those actions that are necessary out of that hearing process. So the next, I think, three or four questions you had, and I'm going to try to, in shorthand, repeat them back to make sure we're getting them all. Um, I warned her ahead of time, I'm tossing them to Angie because they're more technical. Uh, uh, the concrete cores that were taken at the plant and how they were considered in, in evaluating uh, the effects of ASR, uh, what stage of degradation uh, various structures are in, uh, I know, just from listening, I know a little bit about that, but I'm not going to waste time. I'm just going to let Angie try to address that one. Uh, not treating all the structures, and again, uh, I, I think, you know, definitely safety-related structures. I don't know what structure you're specifically referring to, but... Are you talking about the second? So there were two concrete structures built, only one was used actively for the plant. The other one is sitting there. The oh, the unfinished unit. Okay. And that's the see, same see. concrete as okay. the first one, theoretically, hopefully, probably is. Uh, why wouldn't you have tested the concrete on site in that second reactor vessel that was never employed instead of taking concrete from some other place and trying to model it? Yeah, I, I'm not going to hazard a guess at an answer. I'm going to see if Angie knows, but if not, I'll, I'll try to answer it as best I can. And then the slow progression uh, that's been observed but it's been calculated what, out. through PEO. I think the answer to that is yes, but I'll, I'll let Angie give you a, a little more detailed answer than just yes. Okay, so the first question was, um, when you say uh, why weren't cores used to do the ASR evaluation, you're, you're talking about what I mentioned that when they took cores and they looked at the rebar and to look at the condition of that. Those those cores were, um, were taken um, as a, a, a part of a process to install um, through wall extensometers, which are measuring devices that measure through wall right. um, expansion. Yeah. So, are you asking why didn't they do like a petrographic analysis of those? Or yes, uh, any of the analysis that you use to determine the safe the, the degradation of the ASR? Why didn't you just use the cores or some other? You have cores already, you know, or you could take cores. So why didn't you just use so real so cores? The purpose of taking cores. Is to is to assess whether there is ASR, and then from there, um, you know, determine how to how to monitor it. And so, it's my understanding that um, you know the, these cores that 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 they took, um, they were in areas where the ASR was um, uh, was at at, in a, at a point where they were measuring through wall thickness. So I, I don't think that I don't think that it made sense to to test whether there is ASR or isn't because they've already identified ASR in those in those areas where the cores were taken. Those were the, the, the they are called stage, or excuse me, tier three areas where the ASR, just from the, looking at the, at, at the face of the wall, there was enough of cracking where they needed to install through wall extensometers. You know, there, there's there's really no not a lot of value added in then doing a petrographic to then confirm the presence of ASR when it was already evident from from just visual observation. There's no there's no strength type characteristics that can be obtained through a petrographic ex examination. That's just to determine the presence of or lack of ASR. Okay, so let me rephrase that. Then. Okay, you have samples of the concrete. Why did you use the samples of concrete, or did you retrieve? samples of the concrete on the site to do your modeling of the exact concrete because you say you, it was aggregate from other new england uh, quarries or something so so the samples of concrete that, are, that were taken in cores that, that the problem with with, with t doing core testing is that it's it's an unreinforced concrete material um and to mo there, there's really no way to accurately i think the, the dimensions are are Proprietary, but they're but they are modeled as as actual seabrook walls. Um, with you know, and, and what I what I failed to mention before is that is that when we're looking at, at sea, when the NRC is looking at structures to be able to perform their intended functions, first it's safety, it's the interaction between the concrete and the rebar that is that it, that that's actually the the important. Um, uh, <coughs> 
protection for the concrete. So the fact so the fact that the concrete is adhered to rebar that allows for for tensile strength and shear strength and it and, and so when you take the concrete out of its structural context, i.e. it's not reinforced, and then you, you test it, um, the, the 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 results of that aren't you can't there's really not a good way to directly apply that to how the structure would behave. You know, given X number of you know, you know, however inch thick rebars, um, and so that's that's why that you know they, they could have taken a bit more hydrographic analysis, but I think that the reason they didn't is because they already identified that ASR was to a point in those areas that they needed to do through wall um, expansion measurements. Um, so your your uh, the second question here is what what's the current state of the structures? Yeah, and percentage-wise, how many are stage three or tier three? Um, it is in the SE, and and I would and I don't want to I don't want to misspeak. So I, I would and maybe I can even find the exact the exact number. It, there's a there's a there's a fair amount of each. I, I think that you know what I, I'm going to ask you to go back to the SE because I just I I don't just give us a, a ballpark. So ballpark. A ten to twenty stage three, about the same in stage two. Um, there's a lot of in, that are stage one, and stage one is the is the lowest ASR levels. Stage three is the, the more advanced. And ASR. stage four? Uh, so there's no stage four. It's just stage stage three, and the stages have to do with um, monitoring frequencies or uh, no, intervals, monitoring intervals, and the amount of rigorous analysis that was done all the stage threes have very very rigorous you know volumes of analysis and computer modeling and, and that and and as the state as the asr is less severe there's um there the the analyses are a little bit that you know they, they they were able to be a little bit um they didn't have to do a full ansys model for every structure um it just and, and, and the NRC reviewed all, almost all of these analyses for the different stages. We looked at the monitoring for each stage. We we looked at the the results, um, and and also you know did our an, an independent review actually with two different independent groups at the NRC um, to to look and verify. Um, so that uh, let's see the third question that you had was why was the unit two not used the concrete. Um, so we understand. I understand, at least from what I was told from the licensee, that the that unit two was was not kept in in the condition. Um, you know, it was. It, I think it, it was abandoned even before they uh, were able to finish the the um, the dome of the of the concrete. So it was it was concrete that was not. You know, it's it's it's. Degraded in so many other ways that it's that it's not a a representative um, condition to to <coughs> compare with the with the unit one concrete that that has been um, you know up kept um, and I think there were also a lot of accessibility issues you, you know as the NRC we we reviewed you know we you know we have our oversight process and we and we reviewed the license amendment and the license renewal request as it was presented to us and they opted to use large scale testing and we reviewed that testing to make our safety conclusion um and okay and slow progression yes what what does slow mean um so just just in in, in the general understanding of, of alkali silica reaction it's it's it, it is what when you say slow um you know, you're talking about the expansion of, of micro cracks um, that are, you know, for milli inches. You know, very, very, very small cracks. So, to, you know, crack, the, the cracks have to be large enough to even start measuring them, right? Because you can, only, you know, even with the best optical, you know, magnifying glass, you can only, only detect cracks of a certain size. Um, so, at the site. Uh, we we verify that Seabrook is monitoring all. I'll I'll say you know cracking that is able to be monitored, and um, at frequencies that are that are uh, applicable to the to this severity 
of the ASR, and I, I personally have reviewed um, six-month monitoring data for the past six years, literally every six months, and, and it's, there are some, most of the areas have not, over the past five years, even seen any appreciable increase in the cracking at all. Um, the method they do it, I don't, I, it's, we, it, we've detailed it more in the SCR, and, and we can talk after this if, if you'd like, but, but the way that they measure it, um, you know, the data that, that we reviewed, some areas it doesn't appear that it's moving at all, and, in, and, in, and I think that in the maximum it's, that, you know, the hundredths of an inch. Even in the tier three? Even, yes, even in the tier three. So if you projected that out to be safe over the even the tier three over the life of the license extension, it, um, it, it's it's within the bounds of the, the testing. So the testing program went above what you know. I, I think that they they looked at what is the the, the wildest you know not wildest but what's the what's a project a, a projection that made sense to through the life of the plant and, and considering a possible life extension tested limits beyond that, and then added margin, and then those limits are, ba are based there on that margin. Okay, thanks. And then the next one was about seawater. I think. Yeah, 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 so, so seawater intrusion, uh, I think was your next question, and um, my, my high level understanding is that there are programs, dewatering programs that are in place at the plant. Uh, and, and I think that water intrusion was, was known and observed, and they put programs in place. I don't know the details of those programs, but I know that there are programs in place that are inspected. Um, the other issues that you brought up, spent fuel storage, um, the, uh, including flooding effects, uh, the, the cancer uh, data that you referenced, and uh, real-time monitoring. I, I, I'm just gonna say, say that that's not a subject of tonight's meeting. We've taken a lot of time to answer your questions related to that. To the amendment uh, for ASR, so uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna so when is the next uh, time where I will probably hear those answers? Is there another point at which so, we're gonna hear back from? All right. So, so th there were previous questions where I think Brett said that we'll ask the the, the region's been taking notes, and uh, at the uh, annual assessment meeting, which is it is scheduled for April. Uh, but yeah, no, no. Yeah. Now, Gary, Branch Chief out at the NRC Region 1 office outside of Philadelphia. We are having, I think it's April... April 24th. ...is an annual assessment meeting that's broader than ASR, although it's been ASR-centric in discussions for, for the past many years. Um, and we bring enough folks that are versant in what we know of the issues and concerns and focus of, of the folks around here. So we would be able to answer that. I would say that our... Annual, uh, we do have requirements for monitoring, and they're very robust requirements, and they're put out annually every year uh, as to what the releases are from every nuclear power plant, and that's available on our web page. We could get that for you. I think no, that, I'm familiar with that. I'm talking about in the communities themselves. Right. We we uh, focus. We are our mission is focused on the plant and the safe operation of the plant, and we make requirements to them to monitor it. Um, I'm aware that other states have chosen to do something beyond that. That just isn't part of our mission or our, or our oversight. We oversee what's done in the plan and not outside the fence. And, and then the last thing I'm very concerned about is the first responders and whether that sort of training has happened and how that's going to be handled. You know, we would be able to answer that in April, I, I, and it's not my expert area, but I, I, that sounds like it would be a and I'm looking at Justin, probably a FEMA, it, we, our sister agency. We focus on emergency preparedness and capability in the plant, and we work with our sister agency, FEMA, who focuses on readiness outside the plant, and we reach overall conclusions in coordination with them based on uh, drills. And, and uh, so that would be where that, that is an, uh, that's, uh, that's a FEMA role. So right? in April, so, April 24th, we'll hear about that. April 24th, I'm taking notes, so I'll try to be able to answer that. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Philip uh, Herzer. <coughs> Philip Herzler, I live in Newburyport. I am a concerned citizen. I have never derived any income or worked 
with uh, be part of the nuclear industry, so I think you can sort of tell where I'm going to go from here. Um, I am very concerned about the safety um, uh, issues that C10 has raised. <coughs> for me, though, the big, uh, I think, as one of the earlier speakers has mentioned, I think the, the disposal problem is, the long-term disposal problem is one in which I've yet to hear any kind of a hope or a glimmer of uh, a realistic solution uh, nationwide, including, including uh, uh, this issue. Um, and I've forgotten what the other point was I was going to make. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So our last um, scheduled speaker, and we'll talk about how we proceed um, with the rest of the meeting after this, but uh, our last speaker is Jack Van Lowe. Last uh, uh, ticketed speaker. Jack Van Lowe. It's not our Van Lowe. Van Lowe, go on. Sorry. Uh, my name is Jack Van Lowe. I live at 4 F Street. Plum Island, New Report. Uh, I'm also a board member of C10. Uh, my original question was going to be on uh, slide six and what the corrective actions are, but you have touched on that. So what I'd like to go to what's always been in the back of my mind is driving up Route 1, a massive double dome containment building. Uh, the ass assessment hearing three years ago, 16, I think. I was told that the bedrock foundation of the containment building was 21 feet below mean sea level. We yeah, had the other half of the sea level is about five feet up to ground level here, approximately 30 feet down. And I don't know how wide it is, but uh, in my mind, that's a massive quantity of uh, concrete, a lot of cubic yards. And uh, is there any testing of all that concrete? Or how many spots on the containment inside and out are being monitored or observed? Or have you recognized ASR? So, you, so you, your question is, um, you want to focus on below grade concrete and how that's monitored? Well, uh, I just want to make sure I got it. I go back to Willie Sutton. He robbed banks because that's where the money is at uh, Seabrook Station, where the, most of the concrete is is in and below containment building. Right, but so how is that monitored? You, uh, I don't know the answer. I'm going to ask if that's in the SER. Um, so the, the actual bedrock is not accessible. It's underneath the foundation of the containment. All right. Um, uh, but there are accessible areas that are below grade that have experienced ASR and that are being monitored. Um, those areas are not containment. Um, they're, they're, um, you know, there are, there are areas where there has been water infiltration and areas where there hasn't been water infiltration. To be honest, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to make that big of a difference. It, there's, there's really ASR kind of everywhere. Um, as for the containment, you asked if there's, if it's monitored or if there's been ASR identified. <coughs> um, there are a small handful of areas on at containment that are monitored. I want to say on the order of two to three areas that are monitored under tier two of the monitoring, um, <coughs> where. Um, where the uh, the lead the next era is monitoring those areas as potentially suspect areas, but in you know in the years since they've been looking to see if there's been any ASR movement or or additional cracking, to my understanding, they haven't found any um, expansion in the containment area or additional signs of ASR. Uh, one of my concerns is that you have a very heavy dead load. Farther down you go, down to bedrock. So you've got a lot of stress on the concrete. And, uh, if you've got ASR down there and you can't access it, uh, you seemingly haven't done any excavations down to bedrock on the outside and look for symptoms. So, so to your to your point, um, there is a 
quite a large dead load on that concrete. And what that load is actually serves to do is to tighten the cracks completely. You know, when you've got a really, so there's really not a lot of ability for, the, for that below grade concrete to expand and crack because of the loading that's on it in all directions. So we would we'd be much less likely to find ASR cracking in, in those heavily loaded below grade areas than we would on areas that are more free to expand. So, so you know, in our review, that, that, well, that was acceptable on a safety basis because we, we think that, that the, the areas that are able to freely expand are really bounding. So the higher the dead load on a piece of concrete, the less possibility there is ASR? Or is there less possibility that it will show up? It's, it's less possible for there to be cracking because of the ASR, but that's really, if there's no cracking, then there's, there's not a, an issue with the structure to be able to perform its function. Right, so, so really the expansion is, is the concern. So if there's, if there's no expansion, um, there, there, may, there may be alkalis and silicas and water, and it, so there's the, the environment for ASR to occur, but it's, there's less of a concern for that to affect structural functionality because the, the, the cracking is really restrained by the dead load on top and then by the, the loads up the hoop, you know, restraints on the side because it is bedrock. bedrock. But I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, but if you have ASR expansion gels and you're containing it because of dead weight, that doesn't mean that there's not ASR there, it's just that you can't see it. Right. But but the, the but what but the, the concern the, the concern is, is not it's it's not the ASR itself rather than the structural functionality. Um, so the, so if the if the ASR doesn't have an opportunity to manifest itself in cracking and expansion, then then the the concern for impact to the function is is low, right? Because because the, because you you're not you're not causing rebar stresses that you know or and you're not causing a lack of adherence between the concrete and the steel. It's you know so it's. The, the, the expansion is, is just not able to... to but Ferguson, was there any simulation of a high, a high dead load on ASR concrete? What, was there any simulation on a high dead load on concrete? With ASR? With ASR. ASR. Well, um, yes, yeah, so, and, and actually the, the simulation was, was large-scale testing. It, uh, well, there, there was actual load testing on the, the dead and live and all of the load loads that the Seabrook um, structures are designed to. And then also in, in some of the, um, the structural um, analytical analyses, in all of the analytical analyses, the loading, the loading combinations that are, that are part of the, that including high dead loads, um, were, were applied to buildings that received a, a full scale structural analysis such as the containment enclosure building. That, that's a good example of one. Okay. So yes, that was a long answer to say yes. Okay. I won't go into my theories because to say I don't have any education or PhDs behind me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as I just noted, um, and I apologize again for if I mispronounce your name. Um, uh, Mr. Van Loewen, hopefully I didn't just do it again. Um, is that we've now exhausted um, the pool of people who pre-registered to speak. So I'm going to do some two surveys. One, is there anyone who has not previously spoken tonight who would like to speak this evening? Please raise your hand. Okay, we have 15 minutes. Oh, we have one person? Please. Just a quick thing. I serve on the board of C10. I just want to make sure everybody is aware that the testing that this nice person has been talking about this testing is done at the Ferguson Structural Engineering Labs at the University of Texas. So these pieces of concrete that she's been talking about that were tested are not part of Seabrook. They're made up samples in Texas. And further, um, 
Who's doing this testing? It's not the NRC. It's two engineering firms that Next Era chose and paid for. So I think here again, we have a fox guarding the hen house problem. And I think that that should not be happening. Okay, uh, anyone else who is not, I'm going to ask one more time, anyone else who has not previously spoken who would like to speak tonight? Okay, next question. Who here who has previously spoken would like to speak again? Okay, we're going to go in the order in which you signed up. So, Mr. Blanche first, uh, or not, um, Conley, excuse me, uh, I apologize. Um, and then we have 11 minutes, we'll see what we can get through and then go from there, okay? Oh, first of all, I wish I had known that, you know, the time stops when he asks a question, because I had some pretty important questions I wanted to ask. And one of them I spoke with you, is it okay if I call you Joe? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, I told you about, right now, there's gag orders on the, on the Massachusetts State Police and on the New Hampshire National Guard that they can have no opinion on whether the plant can be evacuated during the summer months. And I've gone to a lot of work with these packets, you know, to save you time, so I wouldn't want to bring up a lot of things. But um, how do you feel about gag orders on, the, on first responders? Yes, sir. I I'm not in a position to, to, to comment on that. I, I'm, I'm learning about this really for the okay. first time since I met you. Um, All right. So I'm not, my, I'm not in a position to comment on it. Well, there is. And uh, we've got, there's six towns in Massachusetts within the 10 mile radius of the plant. And five of those towns have asked the NRC and FEMA to hold a, hold a hearing for first responders. So they can testify whether they believe the plant can be evacuated. And that videotape, you know, I really want all three, uh, all four of you, to look at that videotape. And I'd like to have comments on whether you think, because, you know, I've been a business person uh, pretty much all my life. And we got a sec we got a double standard for the secret plant. Because every hospital, nursing home, and business has to obey the laws 365 days a year. Now, if you find out, after you looked at this videotape, if you find out it's in question whether they can evacuate that place safely, and if you look at the, the, the traffic is at a standstill, hundreds of thousands of cars out there, and uh, we've asked Maura Healy, she's looking into it. She's the Massachusetts Attorney General. And so right now, and by the way, um, all the schools within the 10 mile radius, I've talked to the students and talked to teachers, they have not had legitimate nuclear drills. They've had paper drills, which is dog and pony shows. I've talked to 200,000 first, re 200, 200 first responders, and they want this hearing. You certainly wouldn't object to having a, to be in favor of a first responder hearing because those families have, they have families too. And, and uh, I've worked on this for four years, and we got these towns, and we got also uh, Hampton Falls now. And uh, we need that hearing. And I mean, you know, I want to prove that democracy still works in this country. And we need your help to do that. And I've been investigating the NRC for a long time, and my own opinion is, if you license that, if you give them that license, you know what you're going to prove? What I've been saying a long time. The agency is nothing more than a rubber stamp for the, for the issues of the nuclear industry. Here we are. What do we do with a school bus when it, when it fully depreciates? That the owners of the plant, the construction plant, the, the architects of the plant said shut it down after 2030. Now we're extending the license, even considering it, okay. to 2050. We don't let well, school buses ride, take our kids around when they fully depreciate it. So, 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 I tell you, when you look at those packets, I want you to look at every one of them. And I want responses from you because I brought this up about the DAG artists last year. And every one of the panels told me they were going to get back to me. They never did. I want to know why. Thank you very much. Can answer that. Thanks. Thanks for your concern. Are the requests for hearing part of your packet? You, you said there have been requests sent to the oh, NRC. Yeah. Five out of six yeah. of the towns within the ten. No, FEMA too. So the requests are in here. I, I, I looked through this. I had the opportunity. Yeah, the so towns are in there. Okay. 
Um, the, the, other, the other thing I want to just uh, uh, address that you said was, you know, they're, they're, the, the relicensing of the plant, the, the original license of the plant based on 40 years was based on whatever information that the NRC required at that time. Now, this, it, when ASR was discovered, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, that, that was at the beginning of the license renewal review. The license re re renewal review, except for ASR, the ASR issue, was complete uh, back in 2012. So really, if the agency was uh, to, to, to be, a, as you put it, a rubber stamp, uh, we may have found a way, but we, we, we did not. We did not come up with a way to relicense the plant <coughs> without the ASR issue resolved. So since 2012, we have not provided, we have not given them a renewed license until we were satisfied, and that was last year, that they've addressed the ASR. But the evacuation plan is going to be legitimate, and if they can't evacuate the people in time and safely, that's a violation. Well, the evacuation plan is not part of We have other people that I'm not going to be able to. Uh, we, we have other people that I, I think wanted to be able to come to the mic as well. So, so I'd like you to look at the material and get back to me. I really appreciate it. I want your, I want your own opinion after you've looked at this uh, video. And I hope anyone in this room would, uh, you know, if you if you want a copy of the video, I got it. Yeah. Okay. So thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I would have appreciated knowing that if I had asked a question, I could have taken ten minutes instead of three. No, let me let me stop. So, here. so, so no, no, I, no, you've no. done a, you've done plenty of talking. I will. Take I, I, time, I think it's but important. This has been a very I, will, I will give you your three minutes. I will give you your three this minutes. This has been a very unfair use of facilitation. I have to say because I represent the organization that 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 caused this meeting to happen, and I did not have a chance to actually finish my presentation. You know, it's, it's not fair if you're going to tell people that it's only three minutes and then you, know, you end up letting people stand and speak for more than six minutes on issues that don't even pertain to the cause of this meeting. Can I get on with my comments, please? I think it's important to address that and then I will give you, we will go over in time, out of fairness to everyone involved. Normally I said at the beginning of my instructions that I don't usually allow back and forth because it does then expand out. So, however, because those there's only so much I can do as facilitator when people are posing questions relevant to the meeting at hand. Most of the questions, an example, a member of your own group, pose questions relevant to degradation of concrete next to the base lock. I thought that was relevant to this meeting, so I allowed him, a member of C10, to continue those questions. Even though he wasn't, in terms of how much he was speaking, past the three-minute mark. I appreciate that you wanted to give a presentation, and I'll give you that opportunity now. I just wanted to explain to you my methodology out of fairness to everyone in this room. So please. Right. So, to try to complete, um, I think a huge point that needs to be understood at this meeting is that the reason C-10 has filed its contentions that were accepted by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for litigation is because the license amendment request upon which the license renewal application <coughs> depends is not robust. It is not going to result in good monitoring of the degradation of concrete at Seabrook and we have experts, world-class experts in concrete structural scientists concrete structural science to back up that assertion, a number of them. So that's the first point. Second point, these concrete scientists that we're bringing represent the only independent peer review that the license amendment request is going to receive because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allowed Next Era to call their new unprecedented <coughs> system for testing proprietary, that has meant that no other scientists that are outside the industry or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have had a chance to actually check the methodology. The methodology is not good. Just because NRC staff says it's good does not mean that it has been properly and fairly and independently reviewed. Second point. Third point. Just because you all have the power to make this rule, to make this ruling, I should say, on license renewal, 
uh, and, and license amendment from within your own system, and then license renewal, which depends on license amendment. Just because you can do that does not mean that you should do that, because doing that is a violation of the democratic process. And in New England, we stand firmly in favor of the democratic process. It, it is irrational, in fact, and that's why it's been so difficult to under, to, uh, for you all to explain it. It's irrational that there is some system in place by which even though there are standing contentions before the NRC Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, somehow the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission feels they have the authority to issue a ruling on that same license amendment upon which license renewal depends in order to grant the license of the license renewal. There's no reason that NRC needs to do that because you have 11 years left on your license. The reason that that system was set in place is because of the Three Mile Island accident and the fact that after TMI, okay. I hope you give me a chance to finish this concept, after the Three Mile Island accident, there was a challenge to venting steam, radioactive steam, from the reactor containment, and, it, and that challenge ended up impeding the license renewal for Three Mile Island. And so NRC put in place this rule that means that you can take this step without uh, dealing with uh, citizens' uh, uh, founded uh, contentions that affect, that may affect that license. But in this case, you have 11 years before the license renewal. There is no reason for you to take that action independent of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board's decision to grant contentions to C-10. So we're asking you in terms of fairness and in terms of the democratic process for this area that you don't do the thing that you can do and instead do the thing that ethically you should do. Thank you. Thanks. Out of fairness, because I did let C10 talk longer, who else would like to speak? Raise your hand right now. So I have one, two, three, four, and then that's that's it. Okay? So if you didn't raise your hand right now, we're gonna that once those four have spoken again, um, line up the order, it doesn't really matter because you're all gonna get a chance to speak, so line up the mic or I'm Doug Bogan with Seacoast Standing Pollution League. Um, since a lot was asked or mentioned about flooding, I'd like to point out that I've been to several meetings in the past, including the first one that was held on the scoping of the ASR issue, and I raised the issues of sea level rise and changes in groundwater. Uh, we were told at the time from the NRC that uh, the water was fresh water then. I don't know, eight years later, is it becoming more brackish? Will it become brackish or sit more saline in the next 10, 20, 30 years? We haven't heard any response on these issues. Um, there was a study done after Fukushima, of course. Uh, there was a lot of uh, emphasis, certainly, on the issues of flooding, extreme weather, storm surge, etc. And um, I had an opportunity to peruse that study to some degree, um, which was issued last year, I believe. And um, yes, the plant is not within the design basis, I believe is how you put it, um, for this extreme weather, uh, the worst impacts of climate change and um, sea level rise and so forth. Um, and the recommended solutions were some door stops and, and issuing of sandbags. Um, I, I really wonder whether you think you can hold back the ocean and sea level rise and climate uh, disruption with sandbags. Um, so I, I would encourage you to look again at that we should have a public hearing on that issue because it's a serious issue here on the seacoast. Every other seacoast community is looking very hard at the impacts of climate change and we should know what effect it's going to have on the plant and its operations and on the chemistry that affects ASR. So that would be one question. Um, I guess just since I don't have much time and we're getting done here, I just ask, given what you know now from the monitoring that's been done, eight years of research and so forth, can you assure the public that in 20, 30 years' time, this plant will continue to be safe to operate? And if you can't do that 
why are you issuing a relicense and won't we just be revisiting this in 10 or 20 years? I, I feel like it's been uh, Groundhog Day. I know it was a couple weeks ago, but I, I get the sense we keep asking the same questions and we either get the same answer or no answer at all. And I think the public would really like to know uh, some of these answers, which I understand you can't answer here, but somebody should be here in April to answer those questions. Okay, on, on the... Uh on the safety evaluation for ASR and for the license renewal. I'm going to tell you that the staff's come to the conclusion that the plant can be operated safely based on what we know and what the monitoring programs intend to do and we'll be, as I said before, we'll be inspecting those programs over the life of the plant. Okay? The other issues, yeah, I'm not going to try to address those now, but uh, you should have assurance that the agency's done a thorough review here there's programs that are going to be in place, and when the license is renewed, those those requirements will be in the license. Well, again, on the issue of flooding, I, I don't have assurance on that. We haven't gotten the answers, and I really encourage you to, to hold a, a more intensive public meeting on that whenever you can, hopefully before the license is reissued. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. There were two more people. Right? Two more people. If you could decide amongst yourselves. <laughs> Hi, Catherine Kappel from Georgetown again. Thank you so much. This has been very informative, and I've enjoyed being here. Oh, sure. Um, I did have a follow-up question when we talked about ASR, um, that, you know, it can't be um, corrected or reversed, but that repairs have been done, I think you mentioned. I was curious, um, you'd said in one or more of the structures, what those repairs were and why they were made. Was that correct? Did I hear you? Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, um, so the the monitoring program um, that we that reviewed and approved. Microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it includes um, if there if there is an area where um, you know the the program requires corrective actions, then then um, there have been at least one instance that I can pull um, from the top of my head where um, the, um, the ASR had, had caused um, a, some movement between buildings that, um, that um, just like a, 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 a lecture <coughs> joint seal to need to be replaced. Um, the, you know, the requirement was for, for there to be a joint seal there. Like, and a, like a rubber joint. Like a rubber joint oh, okay. seal between buildings, you know, for, um, for seismic reasons um, in some areas there there are elastomeric joints and because of the ASR issue and I, I recall in one area that, that the, the joint had, had come apart that needed to get repaired that was all just part of it you know carrying out the program so we've seen that that the, the program not only monitors but performs corrective actions in a, a timely and safe manner that's thank you and I just had one more question I'd love to communicate with you guys more, but I'm just, when you talked about monitoring and the safety, monitoring was like next sterile, where somebody would do an inspection every three to six months for safety. I, don't, I didn't hear that right. Uh, so so the, the, the monitoring programs, um, well, so safety is, is an underlying basis for, for, all, for all of this. Um, it's, it, I just got that confused. Yeah, so, and um, I apologize if I was the one that, that caused that confusion, but um, the, the areas are monitored as often as every six months, um, up to three years, depending on the, um, the, what has been observed, the ASR symptoms that have been observed to date. And those, those monitoring frequencies are subject to change if and when the ASR becomes more severe in an area, it'll be monitored more frequently. And though we verified that those monitoring frequencies are adequate to detect any um, any sort of expansion that would that would cause the need for a corrective action. Um, so the and, and it's you know six six months is a really short frequency. I was gonna say um, like three years sounds like a long time. Well, so so three years is for the for the areas that that are very that the ASR se severity is very low. Okay. okay. 
and, and, and it's, it's, the, it's the maximum time for any area where ASR has been detected. So those are areas where, you know, you, 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 whether it's barely recognizable up to, Right, like a tier one or state. Like a tier one, that's exactly oh, okay. right. So the so tier three would be more like the six the months. The six months. Tier three is gotcha. every six months. Yep, and tier two is every 18 months. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And who would be doing that monitor in the NRC or Nextera? Nextera is, is responsible per, for carrying out their program. That That's that's why we're, um, that's part of their license amendment. That's going to be a requirement for the re remainder of the license. But the NRC does focused inspections on the program, and and we so we'll continue to do those to make sure that that there's an independent verification that the licensee is carrying out the program in, in accordance with their their license. Okay, but those will be two separate things. Yes. 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 Okay. Us inspecting. The program as they're carrying out, we're doing it. We're 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 inspecting to make sure they're doing what their license okay. requires. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right, our last speaker. Did you ever just start with your name again? I'm William sorry. Woodward. Woodward Durham, New Hampshire. Um, I just had a follow-up question. Um, what is well? What have we learned from Indian Head? The state of New York brought a lawsuit. Indian Point. In Indian Point, excuse me. Indian Point, uh, because there was a suspicion that the bolts were degraded. And so I know this is not related, or maybe maybe it is related to concrete, but I want to know uh, what you've learned from the fact that a high percentage of the bolts were so degraded that they had to shut down Indian Point and repair them. But it took a lawsuit by the state of New York to get them to do that. So have we learned anything from that? For New Hampshire. So I think you're referring to the baffle former bolts, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say something then, and then I'm going to hand the, the mic to no, I, that, that issue is something that's uh, uh, now well enough known that the industry has taken some steps. Uh, the Indian point specifics, I don't recall. I wasn't part of that activity, but um, as far as what we've learned as you know, how to Kind of addressing correct material problems. So I just want to make sure we're clear on your question. Maybe regular servicing of the boat so to see if there's a problem. Okay, so I know there's, there's inspections that are conducted, yeah, that would be service inspections that are conducted to, to, to make sure that those bolts, the integrity of those bolts is satisfactory. Uh, is there anything that you can add to that? Or? Sure. Okay. Any point, my inspectors did. Uh, we also inspected the point, and you're referring to baffle former bolts. They are bolts that hold these plates and around the core. And uh, we have uh, we we have requirements and uh, and commitments from the industry that they must uh, examine the internal ground <coughs> factor. And indeed, because of our oversight. These bolts uh, were found at Indian Point in another plant to have more than expected had cracks. But that is the reason we have a program, that they need to examine these uh, bolts. And when we found more that were uh, cracked than expected, we expected the licensees to adjust their programs and to, and to replace them. So the state of New York, uh, I think they did enter with an agreement, but that's not because of our... We have our requirements, and uh, I'm aware that uh, there was an agreement with the state, but that's neither here nor there for us. And so what we've learned is that we need to ensure that our oversight continues and that our requirements are met. That's probably our, that's what we've learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. I have one more question. Uh, what's plan B? What's plan B for ASR if in the future with the monitoring over the next 20 <coughs> years if we discover more uh, ASR problems. Okay, so for Seabrook, part of the monitoring program is to monitor the other structures in the plant and just to, to monitor the uh, progression of the existing ASR and if there's appearance of ASR in other parts of the plant. That's my understanding. Right. Um, as far as the industry, I think. Uh, uh, the, well, an information notice was issued when this first came to light at Seabrook to tell the whole industry about it. So they they have to be monitoring 
their plants, uh, and if they if they find ASR, they're going to have to take some steps. But this is the only plant in the country that has ASR affected in its structures. Huh? Have we remediated? Is it possible to remediate? Well, I think Angie pointed out that th there can be repairs that might be required to maintain the, the structural integrity and the, and, the, and the ability of the plants to perform their functions. So that's that, that's the extent of it. You can do repairs to make sure that the structures can can do what they're intended to do. Um, you, you're not, there's, there's no magic potion that I'm aware of that, that you, know, you, can, you can use to get rid of the ASR. You just have to learn how to monitor it and deal with it. And I'll, I'll just I'll just add that that you know they're 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 going to need to monitor ASR just like they're going to need to monitor every other aging effect through the through the extended operating period and and if there's something that that they come across whether it be ASR or anything else that is that challenges the ability for any structure or spur component to perform its function they're required to act you know you know so it's 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 one of you know a lot of things they need to look for and that and this is, is just you know one more thing that Seabrook needs to look for that other plants don't thank you that's reassuring okay thank you good before Brett closes the meeting I just want to say a few words first of all those of you who are still here uh, thank you for your perseverance and for all of you that commented uh, provided your comments we really appreciate it that's why we're here at the onset of the meeting I, I said as, as, as clearly as I could that we don't think we communicated our decision on when to issue these licensing actions clearly enough. So that's that's why we're here is to address that uh, and to hear your concerns. I think we heard a wide range of concerns. We heard opinions, yeah, you know, certainly on both sides, uh, whether for or against the plan. But we heard concerns about the licensing actions that, that are before us that are subject to the meeting. We heard about other issues that were brought up and we've accepted material. We've taken notes from the concerns that, that we've heard about and, and the agency is committed to uh, address your concerns. We're, we're committed to the safe operation of this and all facilities and the handling of all radioactive material across the country. And, and that, that's our job, that's our central mission. So. We're doing that. We're trying to, our best to communicate how we're doing that and, and to assure you uh, as much as we can that, that, that we're, we're achieving that mission. Uh, we'll answer your questions in, in other forms just like this as much as we can to, 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 to alleviate your concerns. Besides thanking the, the you who participated in the meeting, that, that was the bulk of the meeting. That's why we're here. I do want to thank the law enforcement officials that are still here. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your, your attention. Uh, maybe you learned about concrete. Because uh, I, I certainly have in the last two years a lot more than I did when I poured some in my backyard. Uh, okay, so there's going to be a transcript of the meeting. There's going to be a meeting summary. Uh, I think there was a slide up here that I almost blew by, but Justin stopped me, that had some links on it to, to documents that you can reference. And uh, again, thank you for your participation, Brett. So I, I don't have much more to add to that other than I would also like to specifically uh, mention Andrea. You know, she was uh, the one manning the registration desk. Without her assistance, this meeting, or her, shouldn't say assistance, without her hard, hard work in planning for this meeting, this meeting would not have happened. So I just wanted to um, especially thank her while I have the microphone on. Um, and so thank you all for coming. Um, the, I think we have feedback forms on the table. If not, they are located on the NRC website. We are always interested to know on how you think our meetings are going and what we can do to improve. And so with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.